Hello, and welcome from Melbourne of all places to a session where we're going to talk in a little bit of depth to three companies who handed the same lemons that all of us in the travel business have been handed over the last few months, have done a pretty good job of making lemonade. It wasn't hard to find companies who fit into this category. In fact, we had dozens of candidates for this panel. It was hard narrowing it down to three, uh, but we did narrow it down. And I think you'll like the choices that we've made. To get things going, we asked each of our panelists to make a short video uh, talking a little bit about their company and a little bit about the challenges they faced. We're going to get into those challenges and how they responded in the session proper, which will start straight after the video. We're going to run the videos one after the other. So um, one, two, three, rapid fire succession. You're going to spend 10 minutes being entertained and then you'll see the four of us again. So we'll see you soon. Over to the videos now. At the first glance, um, COVID-19 affected Zizu as any other company in the travel sector. Um, all our existing bookings moved to a cancellation or rescheduling mode, and we've seen that the traffic went dramatically low. And we had to act uh, immediately. We had to act very quick and redesign our 2020 strategy, our 2020 priorities. We have seen over the last years um, a change of the traveler's behavior. So from only looking for a place to stay, they start looking for new experiences. The boat holidays is an experience by nature. Now COVID-19 added two new elements um, in their behavior. First one is the avoidance of a big crowd. Second one, flexibility around cancellations or rescheduling due to a potential lockdown. Now regarding isolation, that was easy, easy to be solved as both holidays offer by nature the isolation of the sea. As for the flexibilities around cancellations or rescheduling, that was a new product that we introduced this summer after signing exclusive agreements with the charter companies. We have done extensive PR and marketing campaigns as we wanted to create um, a strong awareness to the travelers that there is a product out there that gives them the extra insurance they need in order to travel this year. On the one side, of course, you have COVID changing the demand entirely. On the other side, you still have the technology factor. The low level of adoption of technology in the nautical industry is causing major operational inefficiencies. We at Sisu invest stronger than ever in building our B2B platform. With this B2B platform, charters will be able to manage prices, availabilities and their entire inventory online, enabling them to do real-time transactions across multiple marketing channels. We want to transform this business and bring it from pen and paper to a new digital era. Blacklane began 2020, forecasting record growth and profitability. However, the pandemic revealed our dependence on airport transfers and lowered revenue by 99%. Our immediate business challenge was to restore confidence for those who had to travel. We also needed to reassure everyone that Blacklane had the resources to endure a long downturn together. And we needed to assist 400 employees shifting to remote work. Our first response was safety for guests and chauffeurs. That meant new protocols to disinfect vehicles before and after each ride. It required new pickup processes to eliminate physical contact. For example, 
We replaced handshakes with bows and reduced the number of guests permitted in vehicles. Our second priority was development. We extended our unique advantages in chauffeured travel, safety, duty of care, and filling unused capacity to launch intercity service at the industry's best rates, up to 40% lower than our previous fares. We also committed to new sustainability measures, setting a goal to have half of our vehicles be electric by the end of 2022. Our third response was managing costs without laying off anyone. Thanks to aggressive measures and government aid, Black Lane has the same burn rate as we did before the pandemic. The first result of these efforts is becoming a safe and affordable alternative to planes, trains, car rentals, ride hailing, and taxis. The pandemic is forcing travelers to question each step of their journeys. They must evaluate their door-to-door -door risks and can no longer take any segment of their trip for granted. The second result is a company poised to weather this storm and scale quickly as business returns. Already, several competitors have ceased operations or endured painful layoffs. Third, we have continued to win big contracts. American Express is our newest global customer. The best outcome in this time is the solidarity of our team. We have a new loyalty and togetherness that delivers new services faster and with more to come. Our board also approved the exceptional step of granting shares in the company to all employees, no strings attached. This is one of the most generous employee equity programs in Europe and a true milestone for the company. With our dedicated team solving new travel challenges and a focus on the future, Blacklane will not only survive the crisis, but thrive when it ends. We believe travel is so important to someone's happiness. It really does feed someone's soul. We want to empower people to feel comfortable again, to experience the world, to see different cultures, to have fun and laugh. The role of travel has just become so much more important to me, so much more dear to my heart. It really makes me feel connected. Good morning. Um, my name is Shruti Chala and I run revenue for a next-gen hospitality company called Sonder. Sonder's mission is quite simple. It is to transform guest experience and hospitality through design, technology, and operational efficiency. Um, I'm really excited, but also very grateful to be here today to share our story. It's been an incredibly challenging year. The last seven months have been very difficult. Um, so, you know, in March, when all of this uh, kind of came down, our first reaction was to make sure our employees and guests were safe. Our second was, how are we gonna survive? We didn't have the balance sheet that Airbnb, Booking.com, Amazon had to really weather the storm. So we really were in survival mode. And I remember getting on a call with a few other execs and our CEO and saying, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna maintain our business? How are we gonna keep these jobs for our employees? And it was a six hour conversation. It was a very tough one. But we walked away with four key uh, themes and four key bets. Um, the first one was that we wanted to accelerate our fundraising. Um, we had already been fundraising. We already had investors who loved us and we were able to complete that pretty quickly and were able to get uh, around $200 million in the bank. Again, feel very, very lucky to, to be able to share that. The second thing was um, we had to go back to our landlords and our developers that um, basically own all of our multifamily and our hotel product and say, hey, can we have some relief on rent? Um, and we were successful there. We actually had some clauses in our contracts and so we didn't have to pay out as much. The third was honestly the hardest thing I've ever had to do as a leader and as, as a as a, as a person, um, we had to right size our business. And unfortunately, we had to furlough a bunch of people, let uh, a bunch of people go. Thankfully, we did that really early, early March. And so many of these people are already back with us or have found other jobs. Um, but we actually had to make that hard call. The fourth thing um, was our Hail Mary. And it was the thing I was in charge of. Um, and it is by far the most challenging, 
but also the most rewarding thing I've ever uh, been able to pull off um, and our, our company has been able to pull off. But effectively what we did is we asked the question, who wants to use Sonder during this terrible time? And we found pockets of demand that wanted to stay. We call them the extended stay traveler. It could have been you know, frontline workers, it could have been medical staff, it could have been people that were stranded because they were university students, paired with people that still wanted to experience um, vacation, but wanted to do it in a, in a safe way, in a way that they could travel to. And so we fundamentally shifted the entire business to focus on this customer segment and every component of the business um, did that from our guest experience team to figuring out what's the best guest experience for this extended state traveler to our revenue team figuring out what channels do we need to be on? How do we price um, doing performance marketing and sales two things that we had never done to our customer service team figuring out how to serve this customer. It really was a team effort, um, but we feel very, very lucky to be here where we are at. Um, we're sitting at 80% occupancy, and although it's not over, um, we feel very grateful. So thank you for your time. So, Anna, Focusrite audiences are pretty familiar with your face. What year was it that you won the, uh, the Innovation Summit? Um, I think it was 2015, and I have to say thank you again because we were basically born at focus right on stage and uh, since then we've received so much support and it's been amazing and especially this year it's been inspiring and wonderful so thank you well um i have to say that you inspired me on that day because i i immediately went back and began planning a boat holiday and i've used your service on a couple of occasions so i'm what you could call a loyal customer um, your, your name and, is famous in our office, Rod. Oh, well, good. That's better than infamous, which is not what I'm trying for. Um, so I know your business pretty well in that you bring customers from the other side of the world or the other side of Europe to places like the Mediterranean and the Adriatic, et cetera, and put them on a boat and they have a couple of weeks of good fun. When that couldn't happen, when that sort of travel, um, you know, people from the UK going to Croatia, people from America flying to Italy and picking up a boat there, when that couldn't happen, what on earth did you do? Yeah, so when we started to realize revenues dropping, I was still in denial. I, I forbid my team to mention Corona for seven days, it was very rude. But then I realized what's happening and um, I had to kind of put, in my enthusiasm and I guess we just um, anticipated that there would change in the industry as you said twofold one that um, people would be traveling domestically so we really refocused our whole team on boat acquisition for domestic markets and on the other hand we also focused our team on negotiating better conditions for booking with suppliers and both those things were what allowed us then when the comeback game came in June to actually have uh, a record month. I'm really interested in what you said then about you. Um, you were in denial. Uh, this is an interesting admission. You banned the team from talking about coronavirus for seven days. Anna, you really did have your head in the sand there for a while. I did. I mean, I was jokingly banning it. It was just like obviously coming up as a a constant excuse for things not working. Anyway, it was just seven days, Rod. I allowed it then, we talked about it a lot. But um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm too much of an optimist. Well, I think we better use that admission though as an opportunity to ask Jens and Shruti whether they had their heads in the sand. Jens, what about you? Um, you, you wished I would have my head more often in the sand. No, actually, um, when uh, when those things um, happened, um, uh, being actually being being a global uh, a global uh, travel offering, um, actually we realized this quite early already in in, in February uh, when when Asia um, went went already down a bit, but nobody would have realized how um, how this would play out. And um, 
And I think um, it, it was a shock for, for all of us. And then when, when it reached um, uh, the Euro Europe, Europe, but also the Americas, America being our strongest market, like in, uh, in April, we were down to 1% of our revenue, something that we would, would have never um, 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 expected. And it was a shock. It was not the right time to put our heads um, in, in the sand. We were just like wondering like what, what to do with it. And, um, and as uh, also my, my panel, co-panelists here were saying, like we were putting our heads together, um, long meetings, uh, strategizing, um, um, prioritizing, and, um, and then we took it from there. Shruti, what about you? Was your head in the sand? Did you, did you find yourself and your fellow executives a little bit in denial? I mean, I think it was a combination. I think to Jens' point, we um, had a lot of leading indicators to look for. And so we knew kind of when revenues went down to zero in March, how decisive we had to be. Um, but, you know, for all of us, this is our life. These are our babies. And so we can't help but being in denial for a little bit of time while still operating in a very, in a very decisive and, and quick way. I'm gonna stay with you, Shruti. You were very open about admitting how difficult it was to cut back. And it's an interesting comparison that our two other companies today, I think take a lot of pride in the fact that they, as a high priority, they protected their staff from the impact of the pandemic. They took the view that uh, a company is only as good as its people and they were going to do everything they could to to keep those people in jobs and protected from the impact of the pandemic you went in another direction um that must have been difficult and how do you feel about it now i mean i think there's there's two things um you know i'm jealous now of your guys's beautiful videos anna and, and jens it was really awesome but i shared a little bit about our story um, we had to be really decisive in a, in a few different ways. And one of those ways was having to furlough um, a lot of our staff. We don't have the balance sheet that a lot of the other companies have. And honestly, we had to make that move to survive. Now, in retrospect, we didn't realize how um, impactful our extended stay offering would be and the, our ability to find these other pockets of demand. And so in retrospect, would we have been as aggressive? Probably not. I think the thing that I was open with you, Rod, about is as much as we really embodied the wartime CEO mentality of being really decisive, launching four very clear strategies, I think the thing that we forgot was, wow, this is really happening to employees and people. And these very thousand people, these shifts to uh, people's workflows, work focus, and what they actually do, having recruiters calling on behalf of sales, having procurement people um, helping uh, with, with sales is a huge transition. And so in retrospect, I wish that we um, did it with a little bit more empathy and, and sharing a, a little bit more of the why we were making these, these decisive actions. But it was all done with a lot of love and a lot of good intention, which was we wanted to save the company and save everyone's jobs. But you are right, Rod, in retrospect, we might have done a, a few things a bit differently. And for the next pandemic, if there is one, I hope not, we will do things differently. Yeah, I guess it's good to focus on the things we did, uh, we, where, where we dropped the ball, as, as well as the things where we picked the ball up and ran with it. But let's stay focused on, on those successes now. Um, coming back, Anna, to staff, how much help did you get from the German government? Um, we did get some salary subsidies, but I guess, um, as Shruti was saying, right, it's a very sensitive situation as an employer that we found ourselves in this year. And when, when the pandemic started happening, our investors got nervous and they were just like layoffs, 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 cut, cut, cost cutting. So we had to act very fast and we needed to cut our cost by 50% within one month. But what we decided to do is just um, cut the salaries across the whole company. So we cut the low earner salaries by 10% and the high earner salaries by 50% for a period of time. And as you can imagine, um, we did it as a measure of solidarity and, and to keep everyone, but it certainly didn't bring joy. And I think also as an employer, we learned this year so much about how much um, reliance the team puts um, in their employer in, in terms of well-being. 
And so I think we learned a lot. We learned that we need to be so empathetic and not only be empathetic, which we try to be by not letting anyone go, but constantly communicating this empathy and care. So definitely learned a lot. We're still proud of the decision that we took and yeah, everyone's still here. Jens, you really prioritize the, uh, the health, the well-being, the, the mental health of your team. Tell us a little bit about how you did that. Um, well, it's actually, it's, it's, it's quite comparable to what uh, Anna just, just said. Um, um, like, at the end of the day, the Blackland is nothing else than just the sum of, um, uh, of all of its people. Um, um, and it's also not just, just, not just the 400 Blacklanders we are talking about, but it's also like it's those 10,000 chauffeurs out there, right? They are also um, um, stranded and they also have zero business. And, um, and we rely on them as, and they rely on us. And, um, um, just as, as Anna just said, like it's 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 all about like just being being very true there and very transparent and um, and and constantly over communicating, not talking bullshit, right? Not saying like we're all getting out of this, don't worry, but like really sharing like this is the reality, right? This is um, our cost situation. This is our um, top line. This is our bottom line. Um, not going to work that way, right? We need to all pull ourselves together. We need to um, um, fight all for one and one for all. If we want to make it through this um, situation, through this crisis, um, um, we all need to pull pull up our um, um, our sleeves. And and um, and, um, and 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 that worked quite well at the beginning. But over time, like we are now nine months in this, um, over time, so like it, it's it's automatically eroding at some point, right? So you. Like I think every month it becomes more difficult to keep up the moral and making sure that everyone is um, um, still in the in the boat and um, and that's basically all that um, keeps me up at night. It's not deals that we continue to win and um, it's not vaccines that are going to come. And it's like um, when 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 this will end in um, and we are seeing a, a, facing now a hard winter um, ahead of us after the winter hopefully it uh, will then change for good but until then like we we need to pull ourselves together and continue to uh, motivate each other and like it's been we are talking about programs of mental health we are talking about uh, one on ones like I'm speaking to trying to speak to 400 people on a regular basis individually and and so do my um, my my leadership colleagues and um, uh, everybody has uh, individual um, um, individual situations and challenges to deal with and you just need to have an understanding for everybody every individual is dealing with the situation in a in a slightly different manner. I, I think it must have been entirely Freudian that you just said you had a challenge keeping everyone in the boat. Um, Anna <laughs> is there in Germany with you. I'm sure she can help you with that. Anna, you're actually <laughs> doing a lot of charters in Germany. Yes. So actually I don't, our, I don't think of Germany as a sailing destination. I mean, if I had the choice, very honestly, I wouldn't go to Germany. But a lot of people love it. And uh, they did this summer. So our, our revenues uh, from Germany to Germany grew like 300% um, in June. So, it, I mean, it was just natural. People could only travel domestically and only felt safe traveling domestically. So biggest markets were Germany to Germany, Italy to Italy, which I think is nicer, but whatever, and uh, Spain to Spain. So, Shruti, and have we, you we, ever been on a uh, Shruti, Have you ever been on a boating holiday? I haven't. I haven't. I am not a good swimmer. I actually do not know how to swim, which is an embarrassing thing to announce in in this forum. But I haven't been on a good boating holiday. But then well, you have to yeah. rent a luxury yacht with a whirlpool. I should do that. And I'll, I'll follow up with you later. Okay. And I made a note of one of the phrases, Anna, that your spokesman in the video said. He said, all boat holidays offer the adulation of the sea, which is an unusual phrase um, that I didn't think we'd hear um, <laughs> on our session today. Um, do you think that people are going to choose boating holidays in the future more or less than they might have chosen, you know, non-aquatic holidays because it allows them to get away from the masses and is therefore perhaps from a health and safety point of view, something that's interesting to them? Absolutely. So I think 
while you know the whole crisis has been incredibly challenging, um, definitely we have two goals to achieve. Right, one is to digitalize the industry to change the suppliers' conditions to make them more attractive. And secondly, it's to make more people go on both holidays. Um, and both those goals have actually been accelerated this year. And we saw um, a really big uh, increase in demand for people who had never been on a boat before. I had friends calling me saying, I want to take my 80 year old parents on a boat because we think it's safe. And um, I believe this is a thing that will continue. I think next year, there's going to still be reservation to travel with huge crowds, whatever happens. And um, in the end, boat holidays are beautiful. So I, I, I don't see the, the trend changing in any other direction than, than growth. Well, um, I'm, I'm worried, Shruti, that you can't swim. I think we need, to, we, we need to address that. I'm sure that there are swimming lessons somewhere in the city that you live. Um, Tell us a little bit about the fact that Sonda raised um, a significant amount of money during the pandemic. Was that as a result of the crisis? Was it something that was planned? And what are you doing with the money? So it's a good question. Um, it was something that was planned. I will say that you know we accelerated it given um, the, the, the news around the pandemic. And we were fortunate enough to have a group of investors and people that believed that travel will come back and our value prop is um, even more so probably valuable to the customer today. To remind folks about, about Sonder, our core value prop is really about space, um, it being a digitally enabled experience, which means you don't have to like contact a lot of people, there's not someone in the lobby. Um, and then we just heightened a lot of our focus on cleanliness. And so I think all of that really actually drove a lot of interest in the brand as being a, a opportunity for us to, to really thrive. Um, the other thing I will say, and again, I say this in the most humble way, is that, um, and you know, your second question was, what are we doing with it? Um, it's really interesting to grow a, a business during a recession if you do have the balance sheet. And for us, we're investing a lot of that capital into growth because we're getting multifamily and hotel um, deals at very low um, costs, the rents that we're paying, the margin shares that we're paying. And so we're getting this portfolio that we would have never gotten pre-pandemic. And again, I say that with like, you know, you know, and a lot of humble and privilege because I, I think it's um, terrible what the industry is going through. But from our perspective, it's been um, you know, a bit of an opportunity to grow the business uh, during the, the bottom of a recession. Let's talk a little bit then about how business changed for each of you. Jens, your business was principally pick somebody up at the airport and take them to a city hotel or the reverse. And all of a sudden that just went away. How did you respond to that? And where does the business come from now? Yeah, yeah, you are actually right. Our business was our biggest advantage was actually our global availability in, in 300 plus cities. And uh, we could follow our customers um, when they when they were traveling um, um, around the globe. And um, so this major advantage just disappeared overnight and is now actually a disadvantage because nobody's traveling internationally anymore. So our um, um, and this was probably the biggest learning or the, 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 yeah, the strongest um, learning that, uh, that we just uh, were too dependent on those airport um, transfers and our airline business in general like with huge partnerships with top airlines out there and so on. So what we had to, um, to do is to reinvent ourselves. Now, the, luckily, we are not an airline or so that can't do anything else than flying, but rather like we do have um, a product that... Um, that uh, could also serve a lot of other um, needs, um, such as um, a city to city transfer, for instance, what we call Black Lane Intercity, especially in those days where people would not like to sit in crowded um, planes or um, also trains. And um, um, you, you might know we, are, we always have been, well, since, since quite some years, we are a carbon neutral service also on that component. Like we, um, it, it, um, it, it, um, 
just uh, helped us to um, also also the situation helped uh, felt like the, there is a bit of resetting also in, in people's attitudes and um, and and goals and um, um, our our carbon neutral offering for longer distances as an alternative to to a plane um, um, for instance um, or with electric vehicles um, this is something that um, that we can see is really picking up and is also going to uh, carry us through the next couple of years it's, there's a li high likelihood actually that it can become our new bread and butter business um, and, and replacing the airport uh, transfer. Same as with in, inner city mobility, like shorter distance, we need to um, uh, innovate a bit on our um, dispatching and, and pressing engine and the algorithms, but um, playing a bigger role in inner city mobility is uh, certainly also something that, uh, that a ground transportation provider like Blacklane can bring to the table. Um, so there are a lot of avenues that uh, that we are um, following, and um, and the team is doing a, a great job in in starting to scale those, and we can already see some some early fruits there. So let's understand that a little bit better. Uh, a traveller who might have been taking the train from, say, Berlin to where? What's the city that they might have taken the train to that they're now taking? Berlin. Berlin, Hamburg, day. London, Manchester, New York, Philadelphia, like those two, three hundred oh. mile mile rides, um, where it's like you save you save actually even a lot of a lot of time uh, when you are not um, going to the airport and waiting times and then hopping over and so on. It's so much more convenient. It's safer. It's cheaper. It's cleaner. It's time most time saving. So there's a, the only pr the only challenge that we actually have is creating awareness because this product is not very well known. And people are not thinking about this, um, but there is still travel, travel happening um, so much less than in the past. But people need to go to, to the other city uh, from time to time. And, and um, Blackland Intercity is quite, quite an option. Is it cheaper? I'm surprised by that. Is it cheaper to sit in the back of a chauffeur-driven Mercedes than taking mm -hmm. one of those nice German ice trains? Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, it is. It is uh, because we are uh, working on. We have um, developed a, a, a pairing algorithm that um, that tries to make sure that we are filling both uh, rides of the trip. And this is the magic behind it. It's um, um, if we can uh, create enough demand from uh, uh, London to to Birmingham, but also enough from Birmingham to London, we are filling both legs of the trip, and and thereby we have the potential to um, to cut our uh, our rates almost almost in uh, by half. And um, and this actually is very competitive, uh, easily competitive to planes, but um, also beating a lot of trains. Okay, we've got less than two minutes left. Just quickly to each of you, how much are you doing and how important are you finding in terms of customer feedback, health and safety stuff? Like, I mean, simple things like disinfecting, whether it's a boat or an apartment or a car. Is that important? And are you going to be placing more emphasis on it? First of all, Anna. Yes, absolutely. It's important to do a lot of emphasis on it. Um, we have certain uh, criteria that the charges need to meet in terms of cleaning the boats and in terms of how long they need to be emptied. So, um, yes, we put a lot of importance in it on the boats as well as in our office. Everyone gets their temperature checked and needs to um, disinfect their hands. Quickly, Shruti, how about you in the apartments? Yeah, um, both our apartment and hotel product, it's cleanliness is, is definitely paramount. Um, we also follow um, a ton of guidelines through CDC. The hotel industry has published their own. Um, I'll say that the bigger thing for us, though, has actually been the social distancing aspect because um, of all of our digitally enabled services. You don't actually have to interact with a lot of people to get the service. And that really makes us uh, distinct from a typical hotel. So very important. And Jens, no more handshakes with your driver. <laughs> yeah, so safety, health and safety is massively important. It already, um, Blackline Service already was uh, quite um, quite high standard in terms of um, cleanliness. Um, but, um, but with Corona, now we top this up. Um, Actually, customers are even calling us now to ask for um, for travel logistics, how uh, quarantines um, are, um, are developing here and there. So we are finding ourselves in some interesting new um, new spots. Well, that's a really great series of answers to our questions. Thanks to Anna and Jens in Germany for joining us, and also Shruti in California, and from me in Melbourne, Australia. I hope you enjoyed the session and we'll go back to the Focusrite team.